And joining us now from Manchester, New Hampshire, Republican challenger to President Bush, Patrick Buchanan, often an analyst on this broadcast. Today he moves up to the first half of the broadcast where we address our guests as Mr. So, Mr. Buchanan, the President outlined his economic plan uh, Tuesday night. What's yours? Well, my view of the economic plan, uh, Bob, is that Mr. Bush put together sort of a grab bag of proposals, tax credits here and there. As Jack Kemp, Housing Secretary, said, there are a lot of gimmicks in it. It's designed to get the President past uh, Super Tuesday. I don't think it's the vision the American people need to get the economy moving again, and it's certainly not the long-term strategy to make America first again in manufacturing, industry, business the way we once were. All right, that's your comment on Mr. Bush's plan. What's your plan? My plan, uh, Bob, would have been much more dramatic. I think the president would have had to freeze spending immediately, federal salaries. I think his tax cut should have been much deeper. The capital gains tax cut is a phased-in approach. It's something Mr. Bush has not even fought for. And I think the whole area of competitiveness the president didn't address. Bob, we are losing industries like autos and steel. We have lost TVs, VCRs, radio. The Japanese are putting under assault supercomputers, flat panel technology. They are challenging our aircraft industry. Where is the administration plan to make America first again in manufacturing by the year 2000? It was utterly absent. I think you need an entire restructuring of the tax code, and you've got to downsize government. A 90-day moratorium on regulations, when Mr. Bush has imposed more than any other president, is Mickey Mouse. It is not dramatic enough, it is not deep enough, and I don't think it's going to satisfy folks up in New Hampshire who have been in depression for some three years now. Well, how would you get the Congress to, uh, how, how would you push Congress to do all of those things? The president's going to have a difficult enough, enough time as it is pushing through what he came out for. If you go beyond that, how do you get the Congress to do that? Bob, there is no substitute for a president who will fight. Mr. Bush's problem the last three years is that whenever it comes to a crunch with Congress, for example, over the new taxes, George Bush walks up and cuts a deal out at Andrews Air Force Base, capitulates, caves in, compromises. Now, these people on Capitol Hill have come to expect that of George Bush. And now he says, I'm going to fight you on March 20th. He has no credibility. If he had been fighting for three or four years now, I think he would have gotten through a lot of the package he proposed already, and we would be moving forward. The problem is, I think, is the president's disposition and style and his basic lack of conviction and philosophy and ideas. They know that in the crunch, when it comes to politics in Washington, D.C., George Bush will not fight, and I think they know Pat Buchanan will. Well, it is often said that, that uh, moderates blur and conservatives define. Are you, are you looking for a more partisan atmosphere than we've had in, uh, in Washington over the last four years? I would say that the last session of Congress is the most partisan session that I can remember. Uh, is that what you want, more of that? No, Bob, what you have to do is on areas like spending increases and spending freezes, you have to fight the Congress of the United States. For tax cuts, you can work with the Congress and get pretty much what you want because they're popular. Ronald Reagan showed that. But, Bob, there is a need in this country for vision and leadership which brings Americans together. Democrats, Republicans, independents, conservatives, liberals, I think all of us see our manufacturing base declining. Seventy-eight percent of the American people, Bob, say we are on the wrong track. I think Mr. Bush has not offered a national vision which can bring us all together, work together, and hammer out a program which will put this country first again in the year 2000. We all know we got problems. We all know the economy's in a mess. What we lack in Washington, and it's at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, is a leadership with visions, ideas, and a program for the future. And I'm sorry, as Jack Kemp said, we didn't get that on Wednesday night or Tuesday night. Well, well, that raises an interesting point, Mr. Buchanan, and I think back to 1968 when I bring this up. Jack Kemp, the president's housing secretary, says yesterday that indeed the president's plan contains what he called gimmicks. Right. Are you a stalking horse for Jack Kemp? <laughs> Jack was up here, um, Bob, uh, last week, and he came up, and I will say this. Jack Kemp said, Pat, I came up here, and I'm not attacking you. I'm defending George Bush. I think debate is good for the Republican Party. Bob, our party, 10 years ago, was the party of ideas. We debated them with liberals. We debated them among conservatives. Whether you liked them or not, SDI, supply-side economics, the Reagan Doctrine. We now have a hidebound administration that won't, not only won't debate Pat Buchanan personally, they will not debate issues and ideas with me. There's just a lot of epithets when the surrogates come up here in New Hampshire. Now, that's not enough. These folks in New Hampshire, as I said, have been in a depression three years. They know George Bush's policies help cause it, and they want to see these issues debated. And I'm willing to do that in the final two weeks of this campaign, we're going to lay out a vision for America to which I think Democrats and independents, as well as Republicans, can subscribe because there is no vision out there right now, and it is certainly not coming from my old friend who used to work down the hall from me, George Bush. You know, when Jesse Jackson was thinking about running for mayor of Washington, the mayor at that time, who was a fellow you'll recall by the name of Marion Barry, said the only right. thing that Jesse Jackson's ever run is his mouth. Is that a fair question to ask you? Uh, you, you have been a commentator. I understand you're mm -hmm. a professional politician. Uh, what have you ever run, Mr. Buchanan, that would qualify you for running the government of the United States? You know, Bob, I think the American people are fed up 
with a professional political class whose main expertise is getting itself restored to office and which goes to Washington, but, raises but, its but, own Excuse peg. me, I don't want to interrupt you, but right, you are part of the professional political class. I mean, you've been a politician all your life. That's, that's the I question would, I'm I would, posing to you. I would challenge that. I have been a commentator. I have been a leader of the conservative movement. I have fought for causes, ideas, and issues. I have had eight years right next to the President of the United States. Bob, anyone who thinks the presidency is some kind of managerial job where your best training for it is sitting up on Capitol Hill holding hearings doesn't understand that the Oval Office is a place where conviction, ideas, a capacity to communicate, and moral courage to fight for those convictions are the quintessential elements of leadership. Let's talk a little bit about politics, and I know everybody's going back and going over all the memos you wrote when you worked for Richard Nixon, and all of that is, has become part of the record. But you did practice some pretty hardball politics back in those days, and when Pete McCloskey, a Republican, uh, was challenging your president, Richard Nixon, uh, you wrote some memos and suggested some pretty harsh things. Like, number one, let's try to picture him as being the tool of big Jewish money in New York. What's wrong with big Jewish money from New York? Well, I'm having Mr. Carville is sort of interfering with your question here, Bob. Look, there's, when I was with Richard Nixon, this country was in the Vietnam War, and we were struggling to try to save what 55,000 Americans had given their lives to save. I wrote some tough, hard memos in those days. I don't apologize for any of them. We fought a good, tough, hard campaign against George McGovern, and we beat him 60 to 40, and I will let the verdict of the American people stand on, on those well, years. Well, you say you don't, you, don't, you don't apologize for any of those, but sure. some of the memos you wrote suggested that perhaps uh, you could get the gay liberation movement to contribute to McCloskey's campaign. Perhaps you could get the Black Panthers to contribute Bob, to McCloskey's if campaign. Bob, if you can't uh, are, 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 you, are you proud of that? Bob. Did you read that memo? That was to Hall, an old memo to Haldeman and Mitchell, and that, if that isn't seen as a joke, do you think that Richard Nixon's relationship with the, with the Black Panthers was that close in 1971? Bob, you were there. There were some tough memos written of how we ought to deal with uh, Pete McCloskey and others. Mainly it said, ignore him. And Mr. Nixon yes. asked me to analyze all these campaigns and suggest ideas and strategies. And as I said, I spent six hours testifying on those, and we walked away and did just fine. And uh, I think we ran a good, tough, clean campaign in those years. But that's ancient history, Bob. Up here in New Hampshire, people are concerned about whether they're going to lose the North Country. They're concerned about whether their kids are going to have jobs at all, whether they're going to lose their homes. And a lot of journalists come up here talking about girlfriends of various candidates, and they're talking about 25-year-old columns, this line and that. Bob, the American press corps, the National Press Corps, get with it. Our country's in deep trouble. They want leaders with ideas and some vision who will put them forward. And all this Mickey Mouse digging back into old columns and memos, it seems to me, is a massive distraction from what the American people want debated, which is the future of their country. Well, let me ask you about something your old friend Mr. Nixon did say about you. He said you're all going right. to get 40% of the vote up there. That sounds to me like he's trying to set up his old friend Pat Buchanan. Why would he do that? <laughs> Why would Mr. Nixon do such a thing? I'm afraid Mr. Nixon, as you know, was the chief teacher in the Richard Nixon School of Hardball Politics, of which I was a student. I think he's told me that I am a company man. I'm going to support the president on this. I think he does basically support George Bush. He likes me, he's an old friend, but there's no doubt that Richard Nixon is number one surrogate for George Bush, and I'm going to surprise the old man this time, and I think we're going to do very well, and we will astonish him no matter what he said. All right, Pat Buchanan, thanks a lot. Thank you, Bob. We'll be back with our roundtable. Just a minute.